So this is 7.2 transformations of exponential functions on pages 346 to 357 in your text. Our curriculum outcome is the same. Um, the curriculum outcome deals with logarithms, which we're not going to talk about quite yet, but we need to have a very good understanding of exponential functions so we can then learn about logarithms. Our lesson objectives, number one, to learn how to write an exponential function that has translations, stretches, and reflections being applied to it. Number two, to be able to sketch a graph of an exponential function that undergoes multiple changes. And number three, to be able to use exponential functions to answer questions on exponential growth and decay. So as we've seen in previous lessons, a function can undergo translation, stretches, and reflections. And these can occur both horizontally and vertically. So horizontal and vertical translations, horizontal and vertical stretches, and horizontal and vertical reflections. And if you remember, these all occur from adding numbers into the normal function. So these transformations can take place with exponential functions as well. And a function that is undergoing these transformations would look like this. So this is our new function. f of x equals a times c to the power of b x minus h plus k. Now remember that our basic function was y equals c to the x. So each of these letters, a, b, h, and k, all provide one of these things, a translation, a stretch, or a reflection. So remember that A is talking about a vertical compression or a stretch, and if it's negative, it's a reflection in the x-axis, so that's the value for A. B is a horizontal compression or a stretch, so that's outside of the brackets by the x, and a reflection in the y-axis if it's negative. H is a horizontal translation, so if it's a positive value, so x plus h, it would be moving to the left, or if it's x minus h, it moves to the right. And k is a vertical translation that moves the whole function up and down. So if it's positive, the whole function moves up, and if it's negative, it moves down. Now these are all things that we've seen before. Um, instead of using a, b, c, and d, they use a, b, h, and k, because they've used c as your base of your exponential function. So here's our first example. It says transform the graph of y equals 4 to the x to the graph of y equals a half times 4 to the power of negative 2 x plus 5 minus 3. And we're going to describe the effects on the domain range, equation of the horizontal asymptote, and the intercepts. So remember that these numbers, this half, this negative 2, this 5, and this negative 3, all correspond with translations and stretches and reflections. So the way that we decided to do this in class that we thought was easiest was to take points from the original graph, so y equals 4 to the x, and then apply all these translations to those points. So if we plug in some values for x, we get, when x is 0, we get y equaling 1. When x is 1, we get y equaling 4. When x is 2, y equals 16. And when x is 3, y equals 64. Now the next thing we're going to do is we also decided that to get the questions right, we need to apply our stretches and compressions first. So this negative two is our horizontal stretch. Now, if you remember, uh, anything that happens to the x value is always opposite of what you would think. So because this is a two out front, we actually take half of all our x values and we'll make them negative. So half of all our x values, well, half of zero is still just zero half of one, or a negative half of one, is negative half. Negative half of two is negative one, and negative half of three is negative one and a half. Our y values are all changed by a factor of a half. And so we just take half of all our y values. So we get a half, we get two, we get eight, and we get 32. Now, the um, horizontal and vertical translations are with the 5 and the negative 3. So our x value, this is x plus 5, which means our graph moves 5 to the left. So that means we have to subtract 5 from all of these values. So we get a negative 5, we get negative 5 and a half, we get negative 6, and we get negative 6 and a half. And our y values are all down 3. So that, instead of a half, becomes negative 2 and a half negative or positive 2 becomes negative 1, 8 becomes 5, and 32 becomes 29. So let's graph those on a piece of graph paper. 
So we're going with negative five and negative two and a half. So negative five, negative two and a half would be right about there. We've got negative five and a half and negative one. So that would be somewhere around here. Notice that my scale is different. My horizontal scale is going down and up by one, where my vertical scale is going up by five, so I could fit this 29 in. And then we get negative six, which has a height of five. And then we get negative six and a half, which has a height of 29. So that's way up here. So it appears that our graph looks something like this. And then it's getting closer and closer and closer to a horizontal asymptote. Let's take a look at the effects on the domain range equation of a horizontal asymptote and the intercepts. So I can see that my domain hasn't really changed. It's still X, E, R. My range has gone from, well, it, there's still no maximum to my range because it goes on and on forever, but there is a sort of a minimum to it. And if you take a look at our function here, we know that whatever we get is always going to be subtracted by three. So if you remember a regular four to the X graph, a regular four to the X graph looked something like this. where it increased from left to right. Now, the horizontal asymptote at that point was x equal, or sorry, y equals zero. So now we're taking that whole thing, we're just shifting it down three. So that means that that is our new horizontal asymptote. And that means that also affects our range. So our range is y is gonna be greater than three. It's not gonna equal three because it can't actually reach that horizontal asymptote. The equation of the horizontal asymptote we just said is y equals, that's negative three in both cases. And then we need to talk about the intercepts. Well, we don't have, um, well, we do have a y-intercept. We know that it's gonna be around um, negative three, but it won't quite reach it. So we could say our y-intercept approaches, is a math word that we like to use, negative three. And our x-intercept is definitely somewhere in between negative six and negative five and a half where before we didn't have an x-intercept, now we do have an x-intercept because we have a vertical shift down. So our x-intercept is between negative five and a half and negative six. So here's our second example. It says the radioactive element americium is used in household smoke detectors. AM241, that's just its atomic number, it's 241 has a half-life of approximately 432 years. That means that after 432 years, you would have half the amount of what you had originally. So the average smoke detector contains 200 micrograms, that little U with the tail is micrograms, that's a millionth of a gram, of americium-241. And here's a little graph of how much americium's left over, over so many years. So it's definitely an exponential function. So what is the transformed exponential function that models a graph showing the radioactive decay of 200 micrograms of AM241? So you need to know the concept of half-life. So for example, if uh, after 432 years, if you're starting with 200 micrograms, after 432 years, you have 100 micrograms. And after another 432 years, you have 50 micrograms. And then after another 432 years, it keeps on um, decreasing by a factor of a half. So we need to write it in terms of a exponential equation. So because it's a half life, that means your base or this value for C is a half. Instead of X here, we're gonna have time and T is gonna be in years. And that's important to note. Now, out in front, we're gonna have how much you start with. So for example, after 432 years, we should have um, 100 micrograms left over. So if that's the case, we need to divide this thing by 432. So let's just do a little test. So after 432 years, this exponent becomes one, and one times a half is just a half, and a half times 200 is 100 micrograms. So the way that I rebuilt this equation is kind of using this concept of half-life. So the half-life will always be your base. And then the amount that you start with is going to be your value um, in front or your A value. So it says identify each of the parameters of the function 
and how it relates to the transformed graph. Well, this 200, this value for A, is going to be your original amount. And that is a vertical stretch. We know that um, this 432 can actually be written, if we wanted to rewrite this whole thing, it could be written as y equals 200 times a half to the 1 over 432 times t. And that means that this is a horizontal stretch. This, this value for, I believe they used h. Nope, they didn't, they used b. Um, so b is 1 over 432. And that just makes a horizontal stretch. In this case, there aren't any horizontal shifts or translations, and there aren't any vertical shifts or translations. So in summary, you need to recall all the different types of transformations that can be applied to a function and the graph of a function. So we had horizontal and vertical shifts and horizontal and vertical stretches, and we had reflections in the x and y axis. An exponential function starts looking like this, so y equals c to the x, that's the most basic exponential function, but ends up looking like this. Remember that a is your vertical stretch, b is your horizontal stretch, h is your horizontal translation or shift left to right, and k is your vertical translation or shift up and down. Also remember that a is a reflection in the x-axis if it's negative, and b would represent a reflection in the y-axis if it's negative. You also need to be able to rebuild an exponential function based on key information. So you have to be able to identify that key information given in a question and by using the graph of the function. So your assignment is on page 354 to 357. Uh, good luck and we'll see you in class.